Eh, Okej, okay. ja, vi har ett ganska eh, späckat schema här idag. Vi eh, på Fores har seminarier i denna lokal från klockan 10 till 10 till 3. Eh, vi har precis avslutat ett seminarium om migration. Vi har nu ett miljöseminarium eh, då inriktat på eh, gröna investeringar. Vi har ett miljöseminarium som följer direkt efter det här om fossilfria transporter. Däremellan kommer ni kunna få en macka här ute och sen så har vi två seminarium i eftermiddag om det digitala samhället eh, fokuserat på integritet på nätet och eh, internet som demokrativerktyg. Mitt namn är Daniel Engström Stensson. Jag är ansvarig för miljö- och klimatprogrammet på tankesmedjan Fores. Jättekul att så många har kommit hit till det här seminariet. Där vi alltså ska prata om gröna investeringar med fokus på vad beteendeekonomin, beteendevetenskapen kan lära oss om hur vi ska få mer investeringar i grön teknik. Det är ju uppenbart för de flesta att det är privata investeringar som kommer eh, vara den som är den stora nyckeln till att ställa om eh, vårt energisystem med mera till ett hållbart sådant. Eh, och vi ska då lära oss mer om vad är det som styr de här investeringarna eh, i vilken mån byggs de på rationella idéer och i vilken mån är det eh, mer känslomässiga aspekter eh, som, som bygger, ligger bakom de här eh, investeringarna. Det finns tumregler, känslor, flockbeteende och liknande. Eh, eftersom att två av våra panelister eh, inte pratar särskilt bra svenska eh, eftersom att de eh, har engelska respektive holländska som modersmål så kommer vi att eh, hålla seminariet på engelska. Är det så att ni vill ställa frågor och sen så får ni jättegärna göra det på på svenska så översätter vi det och är det så att ni har några frågor så, eh, eh, så ska vi försöka förklara för er. Uh, Okej, okay, så so then switching to English and inviting Maria Adenfeldt uh, to the stage. Uh, she's part of our um, the research team uh, with Forest uh, Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum and uh, Universitet Utrecht, uh, Utrecht School of Economics uh, that has been working on on uh, uh, mobilizing private funds for the transition to a sustainable economy. Uh, this is a project that has been running for uh, one year and will be running for, for this year or also at least. Um, Maria will give a short introduction of the report which I was supposed to have in my hand but which you can find uh, outside um, uh, after the seminar. Um, Maria will give a short introduction. We will then have comments by Henry Montgomery, Sonny Kapoor, and Mark Sanders will also be on stage uh, later on. Maria, you have the floor. As you all know, we are facing a challenge. Uh, there is a growing and emerging consensus that there is a need for a, a technological shift uh, to curb global temperature rise. And for that reason, we need uh, a huge amount of funding. Uh, and the estimated um, investments need do vary uh, depending on what kind of assumptions you make, what kind of policies are in place. The World Economic Forum, for example, they came up with a uh, figure in 2013 that is needed of 700 billion dollars a year. And it's not that much. I mean, it is doable. Uh, comparing it to the world GDP, it's only 1%. What also is an emerging trend that we build on in our work is that the public funds are not enough. We need private funds as well. And how do that kind of how to actually stimulate private investors to enter the, to invest in clean tech. Uh, this is actually just showing, we, given the challenge that we need more private investments and we need a technology shift, 
there is also another troubling trend is that private investments are actually decreasing instead of increasing. Uh, starting off in 2012, uh, and it's just continuing decreasing. And it's not only, it, it's also shifts in, in terms of Europe. Uh, if you look at the purple, that's Europe, and it's decreasing as well, and decre decreasing more than other, in other parts of the world. And also we see a shift from private investments in the West towards the East. So given this challenge, that was kind of the starting point for a research project. Um, how, how should we mobilize the private capital? Uh, there are, of course, different angles. We could look at the role of the uh, public institutions uh, and what, what, we do, what, what is done with the institutional capital. What, what we tried, or what we decided to focus on, was to look at entrepreneurs. Uh, and their role in actually driving technology change. But then entrepreneurs are also faced with one thing, the lack of funding. So we said, that, okay, uh, how actually, how is the policy framework in different countries um, designed to stimulate private investments and to help entrepreneurs? So that was kind of the starting point, and that also made us kind of, we could actually make use of being researchers from Sweden and from the Netherlands. We took that question and we kind of said, okay, how do we mobilize private funds? What do actually literature tells us? And we did a literature review of investment theory, both in economics and business studies. I have a business studies background, Mark and Enrique come from economics. And then we also did a, just a policy screening of what is going on in Sweden and in the Netherlands in terms of trying to stimulate private investments. And then we came up with some preliminary conclusions and what we are now is that we have a different track. We are focusing on a specific future question, a research question. The literature review really took different angles. We looked at the classical market failures, of course, such as the environmental external spillover effects, path to dependency, the technology locking effects, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't really see that that kind of theoretical framework helped us. We also look at the management of risk, because one of the major barriers for investors to invest private investors to kind of, uh, relocate their fund to entrepreneurs is that they see clean tech as a high risk environment. There's a policy risk, of course, policy changing, leaving you with stranded assets. There's also market risk. What if I invest in a technology that is not really needed in the market? There's also this question is, do we really have an, a risk with the environment? Is it that, of course, is vanishing that argument, but there's still our opponents saying, no, 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 we don't need uh, to invest in this kind of technologies. And there's also this technology risk. We also look at, looked at the traditional investment theories from cost benefit. It's like now or never decision. We start looking at alternative uh, investment theories, such as the real option theory, to have the option to delay your actual investment decision. Then we started looking at these kind of the investment, traditional investment theories. Really look at a, re, a maximizing kind of thing, looking at certain things are perfect, like you have perfect information, etc. So we started looking at the behavioral finance approach, which Henry will talk much more about. Uh, but that kind of led us to interesting nuances in how actually in the individuals make decisions and how they, how that kind of blurs, kind of gives an other approach to how to stimulate private investments. We also looked at the role of clusters. Kind of what do, 
is that important? That is it easier if you're part of a cluster as an entrepreneur to get funding? Yes. There are research evidence saying that. But also, what's the role of such social networks? What networks you as an entrepreneur belong to? And how the investors look upon you as they see, okay, this entrepreneur is involved in a, embedded in a social network that if I invest can give other positive effects. Briefly about the policy mapping in the Netherlands. Uh, we identified about 19 policies in energy transition. Um, and I don't think I have time now to really go in detail now. <laughs> no. <laughs> but what we saw is that the Dutch policies really assumed rational decision making. The policy mapping in Sweden, on the other hand, uh, was very much, we very much identified policies within uh, the, na the National Environment Technology Strategy that is in place now. And we also see a different approach when we looked at the policies in Sweden. They're more up towards networking, building platforms, uh, getting investors and entrepreneurs to meet. So in sum, we say, okay, the starting point for this study that we did, but this, there is a stronger scientific certainty of the climate change, and we need uh, more private investments. We also saw, looking at pol the policy comparison, that there are different approaches in different countries, of course. And then a third conclusion that maybe is really what we're, where we're at now is that how do you design policy instruments that embrace both the classical market failures, more the behavioral characteristics, uh, and also take into account clusters and social networks? So that's our path forward. Uh, we said it's what we're doing now is that we try to understand the investment decision process between the investor and the entrepreneur. Um, we're doing interviews with both investors and entrepreneurs and see how they reason when they make decisions. Uh, and we build those kind of questions in looking at the real option theory, the social network theory, and also behavioral economics to a certain extent. So that's where we're at now, and we're designing a survey that's going to be launched in the fall. Uh, thank you, Maria, uh, for this uh, introduction to, to the topic. Um, I would now like to invite both uh, Henry Montgomery and Sonny Kapoor to, to the stage, where Henry will, Henry Montgomery, who's a psychologist, a uh, professor from University of Stockholm, um, who's with a, with a great knowledge on both, of course, uh, psychology, but also he's written a report on the, the financial crisis and lessons uh, for Europe from psychology. Um, so what, what Henry will be doing is to give some of his thoughts on the behavioral aspects of the lack of investments, but also focusing on the, on the uh, nudge um, mm. uh, terminology, which has been used by many green uh, NGOs and advocates uh, as, as a way of actually <coughs> nudging more uh, green investments. So, Henry, uh, give us your thoughts. Okay, thank you. I will first say a few words about how psychology and then in particular what is called behavioral finance or behavioral economics, so that's psychology applied to economic settings and financial settings, how one views human decision making in this area. And this is a view which contrasts with how economists tradi traditionally describe the human decision maker. Economists assume that decision making basically is rational. People make decisions which maximize returns in the long run. But psychologists, on the other hand, have found of lots of evidence uh, that there are limitations of human rationality. Therefore, psychologists speak about bounded rationality, limited rationality, and typical features of some typical features of bounded rationality are the following. First, limited information processing capacity. Only a few pieces of information can be handled simultaneously. A classic article 
on the limits of human information capacity was called the magical number seven plus minus two. Uh, later research has shown that this number probably is lower, let's say three to five pieces of information. And then secondly, and related, use of simple decision rules. Instead of uh, maximizing utility, people use simple decision rules like taking the first alternative that meets some minimum requirements and then stop. A third feature is a distinguish, be, distinction between automatic versus reflective cognitive systems, often called system one versus system two. Many decisions are made very quickly based on largely unconscious gut feelings. And on the other hand, there are decisions, um, there are decisions, let me see. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, there are decisions uh, which are more reflective, slower, and more conscious. And um, so we have a capacity to, to be more rational than we actually are sometimes. And then fourth, lacking self-control. Our visual self, it's called so, which consists of bodily drives, emotions, the body kind of, takes over sometimes and determines our actions against what is best for us in the long runs. Uh, this is not only true for children, but also for grown-ups. Uh, availability bias. What we can see, hear and touch is more real and has too much influence on our, on our decisions. So Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the book uh, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, he coined the expression Y-A-A-T, what you see is all there is, which is not obviously true. <coughs> Time asymmetries. For example, we discount future values too rapidly. So what is now is more valuable, kind of, more positive or negative value, have a heavier, heavier load than what is longer, especially far ahead in the future. To this comes that people are extremely social beings, um, which, uh, which are, who are heavily influenced by how other people behave, especially those who belong to one's own group. One who often talks about social norms here. But, on the other hand, there is also a positive side here. People also have a decision-making competence that is beyond more than rationality. For example, we have sometimes a fantastic ability to see meaningful patterns in the information, which no computer or no automatic system can see. And we could be very creative sometimes. We are the creative animal. Now, how to overcome these limitations and biases that I have talked about? Simply use creativity to create so-called nudges which can he help people to make more rational decisions. That is, decisions which are better for themselves and others in the long run. Decisions that you would not regret in the future. But what is a nudge then? Nudge, literally it means to push against, gently, gentle push, especially in order to gain attention or give a signal, a gentle push. And what does it mean in behavioral finance? As defined in Thaler's and Sunstein's best-selling book, Nudge, they, they coined this expression, Thaler and Nudge Sunstein. They say what, the following, a nudge is any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any op options or significantly changing their um, economic incentives. To count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not mandates. Putting a fruit at eye level counts as a nudge. Banning junk food does not. And I will just finally give some additional examples of nudges. Good default alternatives. Decision situations often include a non-choice alternative. You could choose or not choose. But still something happens if you don't choose. So then the idea is to create very good default alternatives that are better than those alternatives that, are, that people find themselves, because people are often lazy, they take the default alternatives. For example, the default alternative in the Swedish PPM system, which is, actually has turned out to be a very good one. Uh, increase availab availability of good alternatives so, so that you really can see and touch them. For example, the red cross button when you deposit empty bottles and cans, you know, the green button or the red cross button. Uh, Make it easier to overcome resistance or carry, good carry out good alternatives. 
for example, pre-filled out tax return forms, which you have in Sweden. Everything is filled out. Extremely good service at the tax authorities, which you also have in Sweden. So make it very, very easy to pay your taxes and do you do it. Then people do it. Yeah. Pre-commitment. Decide now which decisions you will make in the future. This could be good since people tend to be more rational when they have a long-term perspective. The nudge here could be decide now, for example, how much money you will do donate at some future time. You will be much more generous in the future than now. So decide now then what you will do in the future and then have a binding commitment to do this. Or you could also do the same thing with pensions, saving for pension systems, which has been a to not function very well in other countries. Uh, and finally, use suitable framing of cho choice alternatives. Choice situations can be framed in different ways, structured different ways, for example, in terms of getting gains or avoiding losses. So reframing a decision gives new nudges that facilitate more rational decision making. So that's what. Henry, uh, now I'm very happy to welcome Sonny Kapoor on stage, uh, who's, is, has been an investor, uh, knowing the financial markets very well. Uh, he's the director of Redefine, he's been advising the European Commission on the financial crisis, you're advising the United Nations on green finance, you're advising the Norwegian government on how they should spend their oil fund, and much more. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Uh, I just wanted to roughly give the context uh, for what for was actually a very good study by Flores and they demonstrated how investment is falling and you know I mean we've been living within the narrative of austerity that the money is running out there isn't enough money but frankly if you actually look around we have money crawling out of our ears and noses there has never been as much money as much investable money as much risk capital in the world as there is today if you look at the stock of financial assets in pension funds sovereign wealth funds insurance firms central bank reserves all the central bank money that's flooding everybody it's absolutely ridiculous. What has broken down is the financial intermediation that exists, in theory at least, to connect the sources of savings from where there are too little investment opportunities but loads of excessive savings to where the investment opportunities actually lie. And this breakdown has happened at a global level. It's not just a national level breakdown where, for example, Germany can borrow at negative effective rates. Investors are throwing money at the German government and the German government has infrastructure projects, positive return infrastructure projects to make and those investments are not happening. When was the last time the New York Stock Exchange was actually used to mobilize money to invest in the real economy? That was probably about 30 years back, at least at an aggregate level. And similarly, the pools of savings we have in aging demographic societies are not making their way into the developing world where the investment opportunities lie, where the demographic is much younger, and where in the context of climate change, that is where the best incremental renewable investments lie. It is much more efficient to stop another coal fire plant being built in China, in India today, than it is to try and essentially tweak what are existing energy systems. Yet at an aggregate level, capital keeps flowing uphill from the developing countries up into the developed world, from what ought to be sustainable investment opportunities back into what we know are sunset industries. And it's not just some of the individual irrationalities that were so well described that contribute to it, but these irrationalities exist at a macro level too, both within the private and the public sector. Let me give you an example. Uh, so I used to advise the Norwegian government and that has a very nice narrative which is that we are taking oil out of the ground and then we are going to diversify this by investing in a global portfolio of stocks and bonds. So that's the narrative. There is something which is called mental accounting which is also one of the behavioral biases that exists which is people have a jar of holiday money and yet they have credit card debts. So in theory, of course, it's all the same. Money is fungible. But in their mind, they compartmentalize this. The Norwegian government, which is supposed to be, you know, well-governed country or neighbor, and of course, they're not as sophisticated as you, have done exactly the same at a national level. 
So one part looks at taking the oil out of the ground. The other part, which happens to fall under the finance ministry and the central bank, looks to invest this money. Now 15% of this money that is being invested is being invested in oil, gas and coal. Can anybody tell me if anybody with any common sense would instead of diversifying away their risk, double up their exposure to the one biggest source of risk they have, which is the future expected price of oil and gas? This is happening within a reasonably well-governed country at the government aggregate level, not just at an individual level. There are loads of other biases that once again skew the system against the green economy. So basically what we have is if you look at the cost structure of renewable versus, uh, versus dirty investments, particularly green generation. So there's a high upfront cost if you install a windmill or a solar plant and then there is more or less zero cost of operation. And if you install a gas turbine or a coal fire plant, there's some cost, capital cost, but that is lower. Most of the costs lie in the future and are uncertain. And human beings are simply not designed to cope with this sort of price structure. And that is probably the biggest constraint we have at the micro and at the macro level as to why even when it makes economic sense, even makes, when it makes financial sense, uh, more investors are not behaving in a way that is collectively and individually beneficial. We all know the examples from when people were actually offered money to insulate their loft or it was being done for free and people still wouldn't do it because it was too much trouble to actually clean up the loft. And then there were schemes that said, oh, actually, we'll clean up your loft for free. And the behavior changed. So the good thing about most of these behavioral biases, and I'm not going to go into the detail of those, is that they can all be corrected. And while in many situations it is nudges that are appropriate, a slight tweak, a slight information, the way things are presented. For example, if you go and buy a washing machine, if instead of having a price label, that is the retail price, and a rating, which is A, B, C, D, E, which frankly are apples and oranges are not comparable, if you had a lifetime usage cost, two price labels, then according to the behavioral specialist, significant number of people will buy goods that are more energy efficient and have a lower lifetime usage cost. You can add a little nudge to it by introducing a regulation that says the financing cost, because most people buy on credit in a number of countries, of goods that have a lower lifetime usage cost should actually be 0.1% lower. And it just makes that option that much slightly more attractive. And it's rational. But there are certain instances, for example, in the EU's decision to ban the use of incandescent lamps, where nudges themselves are simply not enough to overcome the massive biases we have in our behavior, which is some of the hyperbolic discounting rates that were talked about, that we really are reluctant to, and that's also why we procrastinate in real life. We are reluctant to take actions which have a short-term cost, even though we know in our heads that they will deliver a long-term benefit. So sometimes the better option is actually to just ban those options that lead to collectively dysfunctional behavior. Nudges are important, regulation is important, information is important, but sometimes bans are perhaps the best policy. I'll end with one big example, which is if you look collectively at investor behavior, people recognize, and actually even within their internal reference points, a lot of, I work with a lot of l large investors, call the fossil fuel industry sunset industries. Yet there is a massive aversion to any kind of loss recognition, to saying that, yes, we've made this decision, we should sell out. There is a massive optimism bias that somehow this will remain profitable for a while, or that when the shit starts hitting the fan, you can be the first investor that will sell out. If you remember Chuck Prince of Citibank, just at the eve of the crisis said, we know that there's a problem, but as long as the music is playing, we've got to keep dancing. The implicit assumption is that you can be the first one in the game of musical chairs that will get the seat, but inevitably somebody will be left standing. So one interesting concept, and I'm just suiting this as an example, 
is to introduce mandatory carbon stress tests for all fiduciary investors. All investors, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, in, uh, insurance firms, which have your money and banks, ought to simply say, what will happen to my portfolio if carbon price goes up to 20 or 30 and report it. And in doing that, that will already change behavior. In doing that, it will change the anchoring that was spoken about by the previous speakers. What is the baseline? What is the norm? Today, the norm is that if you are actually a progressive, forward-minded, risk-conscious pension fund manager, if you want to take this risk into account, all these incentives are biased against you. People will think you're an idiot. You might even get fired. But if you introduce such a test, the, this reverses the burden of proof. This reverses the norm. And the power of norms in financial markets is enormous. So I'm overall optimistic that together we can make some good things happen, but it may not be enough to just use nudges. Thank you so much, Sony. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, I think you can stay on stage. Okay. Uh, we welcome up Mark, Henry, uh, Maria as well, uh, if you want to join for the for the panel discussion, Henry as well. Yeah. Um, uh, what what struck me when when thinking about nudges and most examples that has been used is of course on a individual consumer perspective that you 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 receive a, a smiley on your electricity bill if you are energy saving you you can see how you're performing uh, compared to your neighbors uh, you mentioned the isolation of the lofts but to what extent are these transferable to the financial markets or the big investors if you're a venture capitalist or if you're in a, a investing for a large pension fund to what extent are those kind of nudges transferable i think maybe we'll invite mark into to the discussion uh, to have yeah. your thoughts yeah so so we we've been talking to uh, to to investors and uh, and of course your your intuitions right they're slightly more sophisticated than uh, than the average consumer and so your nudging if you want to do any nudging has to be slightly more sophisticated um but what uh, what is what is also clear is that they are not immune uh, to these behavioral biases and they uh, that investment um and this is really a clear result, is, is clearly a, a, as, as much a social process as it is an economic calculation. Um, actually, it's not an economic calculation. The, the investors do the calculations and then they start making the decision mm -hmm. after that. So the numbers need to, f to, be, to be done and then the decision-making process starts. So it's, it's, it's very much a, a behavioral, a social process. Um, and norms, I think, uh, I, I totally agree with Sonny, uh, norms and norm setting is one role that the government can definitely take in that respect, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Henry, uh, I know that in, in your report on the financial crisis, uh, uh, there is something on, on, on the group behavior uh, where everyone is basically running one direction. Uh, this this thing called uh, collective conservatism that um, a, as a group uh, people tend to be a bit conservative. Mm -hmm. um, to, to what extent is your sense that this is possible to, to change via a nudge or similar approaches and, and when do you reach sort of a, a, a um, uh, mass that, that would is actually changing behavior also for others. How many do you need to be to change others' behavior? Okay. Just me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the trick is to to stimulate a, a certain minimum n number of uh, enterprises so, and uh, agencies and so on to be first in really changing the direction. And it, it should be respectable if companies and so on, so people really look at them. And then if you get, get, reach a critical number, the others will follow, follow after. But 
we are not there yet. But on the other hand, it's not really the same kind of group think here, I think, as it was in, during the financial crisis. There are lots of critical voices and lots of people saying, we have lots of seminars like our seminars and so on. Uh, at the, in the financial crisis, practically everyone thought in the same way. Those who shouldn't do it also did it. So we have, we have an opportunity still to change. But then I think there are some nudges which really could be used, perhaps. For example, uh, if you apply for uh, subsidies for green, for sun cells or something on the, your house, uh, you could have uh, also a default alternative for which, which company to choose, uh, some concrete alternative, which has been thought out, that's what my own idea, uh, which has been kind of well prepared before, which people very easily could choose. Or another thing, if you could make this very economic investments, green investments, very attractive in other senses, aesthetically, for example. So, for example, sun cells, if you could design them in a very nice way, that people think, oh, what a nice building when you see these. Actually, they are quite nice. In, in Uppsala, they have now at the railway station uh, an apartment building with sun cells. It looks very nice. So, if you could stress on other aspects which attract people immediately, then what? Like yeah. design, aesthetics, just a few ideas. Uh, Sonny, who's been, of course, on the investors' side, but also have been advocating uh, to the Norwegians and many, many others to invest more in, 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 in green technology. What is your sense? How, how big does the mass have to be in order to be critical or a game changer? Um, how many? In big investors, do we need that actually take the step before other will follow? Well, um, as we have seen uh, in the past, I think the best thing that could possibly happen in the green investment space is uh, we need the recreation of an internet bubble, essentially. And I think there will be investments that are made that will turn out to be duds. There'll be amazing investments that are made. And if you look back, we're still benefiting. Actually, if you look at optic cable fibers that were laid at the height of the internet bubble, we are still really benefiting from that. And so individuals will lose collectively. And now, I think what's uh, very interesting to look at is the example of Tesla. So Tesla hardly sells any cars and has managed to, through making uh, the product and, and I think what, what you said about being attractive and appealing and aspirational and cool and sexy yes. has managed to get a market capitalization that is, I think, half of General Motors, even though it sells a completely tiny fraction of cars, has next to no profitability at this stage. And I think what we need is more of these headline-grabbing sex appeal yeah. initiatives in the green space which will make the space very attractive and the question will be and it goes back to what I was talking about market norms the question will be when investors confront people who actually uh, they manage their money for uh, the question would be why are you not in this space mm. and I think that's hugely important so what you need is to work both on the upside of making things appealing as well as demonstrating what I was saying through the example of carbon stress test, the risks of business as usual, because working on just one of these sides is not going to be enough. Um, you, you both mentioned, I think, both uh, Henry and Sonner um, and Marie as well, the, the risk of stranded assets, uh, you mm. call it the sunset industries. Um, to what extent are people um, are they more afraid of losing things or are they more stimulated by actually winning the big prize? Mm. So if, if one is to convince people to invest mm. in this or that, should one sort of threat them that saying, if you're not doing this, you will end up losing a lot of money? Or should you say to them, uh, if you do this, you will end up making a lot of money? May I? I think it's both because it's not guaranteed that if people decide to sell out of oil, gas and coal that the money will actually then flow into renewable energy. And I think that is why you need both. You do need people to sell out of those assets. At the same time, you do need money to go into renewable energy and green industry, not just be invested passively in you know, healthcare, consumer care, etc. 
And I, these I are would say that avoiding losses is, I agree both, but avoiding losses I think is still more important. I mean, if you only are looking for, for profit and, and at the same time assume that it weighs less heavy than the other way around. But, but isn't the yeah. problem here yeah. that Park, yeah. this, this loss, this, this potential loss, is actually not real? Um, it, because the, the carbon bubble or, or, or the fact that you, you'd end up with stranded asset, that, that depends on what we do in terms of policy. Um, and if policymakers don't move, those assets will not be stranded. And so, and, and when I talk to investors, and this is a, a different crowd of investors as VCs, and, and, and so they're much more at the micro level, but if they talk about the government, it's typically in, in the sense of, we don't care what they do because we can't predict that, and we can't manage it, and we, we don't, we just discount it. If that's what they're also doing, and, and I haven't spoken to a lot of asset managers in, in the, the sunset industries, but if they're also discounting the resolve of the government to actually do something about this, they're actually rational in, in not acting as we would like them to act. Um, be before uh, having some uh, questions from the audience, I would like to ask Mark and Maria, who have been looking at the, uh, the different policies in Sweden and the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. ask you two questions. What have they done good with these policies in order to stimulate more investments? And also, to what extent do they actually take into account uh, the behavioral aspects of investments? Uh, Maria, perhaps? As far as the national nets, the largest one in Sweden, we don't see that many results yet. It's not that far gone. But the positive side is that they devoted uh, actual time on coordinating the agencies to be set forward. How should we support the different that's one way of actually kind of saying not by increasing coordination between different initiatives driven by agencies in Sweden I think that's a big step forward instead of running in parallel and, uh, also there's a focus on more uh, incubator work and also in, in internationalizing clean tech which is also given Sweden an important area because Sweden is not that large of a market. Well, for the Netherlands, it's what, what is interesting is an interesting contrast. The, the Dutch policies are pretty much coordinated from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So it's one ministry in charge. And it's a very particular in, uh, ministry. It's the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So they take a very um, no-nonsense economic approach, rational approach to, to policy making, and they're setting up uh, elaborate schemes to, uh, to have the lowest cost uh, um, uh, alternatives be, be uh, stimulated. They're actually, they're rather successful in, in doing so. They're ignoring completely the behavioral side of, of investment making. Um, and what is, uh, if you talk to the investors, what is their main response is that um, the government's not a reliable partner. In the sense that uh, if, if you ignore these behavioral aspects and, and the uncertainty that's involved and you just do the, 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 the standard calculations, you give a subsidy, next government comes in, they change the subsidy scheme, another government comes in, they don't believe in climate change. We've had a lot of governments in the Netherlands uh, recently. <laughs> um, so, so investors have started to basically ignore these policies and they're much, more, much less effective than they could be um, um, as a consequence. And the other interesting thing is we've, we've we had a student of mine uh, do these preliminary interviews now with, uh, with VCs and you see a change. Um, initially uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands but also in, in the rest of Europe there was a lot of competition among uh, VCs for the, for the best And projects. by VC that is uh, venture capitalists. Venture capitalists, yes. Um, they were looking for good projects and they were competing with each other and currently because of, well, they do experience a lack of funding. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of funding but not for VC. Yeah. Um, they are starting to, uh, uh, to, to much more cooperate and work together and look in, in these networks because they want these projects to be funded and they can't fund them themselves and they can't 
prepare the risk themselves. So they're, they're looking much more into these networks and clusters. And I think in that sense, the Swedish policies are, uh, could, could be a, a useful inspiration because we're moving from a competition to a cooperation sector, mm -hmm. basically. And I think that's good, but we need to make policies for that. Uh, okay, uh, we've got a, a four or five minutes left. Do we have any question from the audience? We do. Um, I'll pass you my mic. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Kitty, and I am currently doing research on the connection between emission scenarios, um, restricted oil prices, and asset value within the fossil fuel industry. And one interesting thing is the huge discrepancy between the demand scenarios projected by, for example, the International Energy Agency and the projections from the actual fossil fuel companies like Shell and BP and this huge gap between the demand that the industry is projecting um, uh, versus the demand that we are hoping for in terms of climate targets. I was wondering what are your thoughts and ideas on what is needed to um, make this, these scenarios converge and make the industry actually um, take into consideration new policies, etc. Uh, I think Sony perhaps. Uh, well, one interesting trend that's happening is that a lot of uh, public and private institutions are starting to use internal shadow carbon prices. So the European Investment Bank, for example, I can't remember the number, but it's fairly substantial. And I think to have, and this is perhaps goes into regulation more than nudge, to have disclosure of what is your assumption upfront in annual reports, be it financial investors, etc., on you know what's your assumption on the future of carbon scenarios, essentially, uh, would be a very important source of indicating where the discrepancies lie. And if there is a cognitive discrepancy, that is going to lead to some sort of action. Uh, the second quick thing here is that uh, it's, I think, extremely critical in terms of anchoring, and this partly addresses the point that Mark was making, for public authority. So the one thing, if you look at interest rate curves, right, I mean, there's a market interest rate curve for Swedish government bonds in two years, five years, ten years. The one thing we know is that two or five years from now, the interest rate will be anything except what the curve says today. Yes. But given the scenario today, that is sort of our best estimate. And we've been discussing with the European Commission and the Central Bank, etc., the idea of publishing forward carbon price curves, which essentially would be aspirational targets that they will go for. And I think that can play a role in converging market discussions and norms. For example, in the discussion before a bank decides to fund the projects, etc., it will look at how compatible or not this uh, the assumed price is what has been indicated by public authorities. And the analogy is very good with something called bank stress tests. So what happened after the crisis is that regulators have started, and this is socially accepted now, to get banks to take into account highly unlikely but possible scenarios, such as what will happen if Swedish bank uh, house prices fall by 40%. And banks are then expected to take upfront expensive actions, such as building up levels of capital to protect against that scenario. But you don't have to go that far. Even if you simply say it may be unlikely that policymakers will get our act together and will get carbon price to 30 euros or 40 euros, but it's possible. And that's already very important in terms of how risk is processed. Uh, I think we've got time only for one more question, unfortunately. Hello, my name is Katarina Brunet. I'm an entrepreneur within sustainability and also the co-founder of the new network Nudging Sweden, which will be launched this Friday here in Almedalen. And uh, I was looking for a more international perspective. We were talking earlier of what kind of nudges work and doesn't work. Do you feel that it could be a difference between what, in what country you're in or what culture? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I think maybe we can have uh, each and every one just one or two minutes on it because we well, need to wrap up. My very short answer would be that yes, yes, that will be crucial uh, because we're talking about trying to nudge behavior and behavior is culturally determined and, and it has all kinds of norms and, 
and, and values in, ingrained in it. And so, yes, it will definitely have a big... Uh, there will Different nudges will work in different contexts, I'm quite sure. Well, um, can I give examples? Or maybe someone else. Yeah, yeah let's have someone else. Yeah, I'm sorry, Marco. <laughs> I'm going to think about We've that. We've got two more minutes. Yes, I, I also think it would. Uh, I think, um, for example, in Sweden, it's in Sweden, people have uh, actually they they trust our the state, the government, the authorities. Right. So here we could. It works to have pre-filled out uh, tax returns and people. Will, but I'm not sure that it will work in, in Italy and or in France. I'm not so certain about that. You, because you, you actually. I think that, that, you know, that people must behave that the nudges must come from somewhere else, not from the state, perhaps. So the, the, the one which is behind the nudge could, could, should be different in different countries, I think. I have a slightly different perspective. I think within uh, you know, narrow context, yes, there's a cultural specificity, but basically financial markets are idiotic everywhere and are idiotic in remarkably similar ways and not just idiotic across... Uh, geography, but also idiotic across times, as in lessons learned from previous crises are very shortly forgotten. Uh, uh, so I think that you know there's a reasonable hope for standardization uh, of okay. nudge behavior within at least financial markets. I agree. Uh, as you might notice, there are people coming in here. Uh, we've got a seminar starting at exactly eight minutes. Uh, I thank you so much, uh, the audience thank you all. Uh, and the panel for being here. I think this was very uh, interesting. We will continue uh, working on uh, green finance, on nudges, uh, and other uh, aspects of environmental policies. Thank you so much.